Well, and great welcome to the program. This is Inside the Newsroom, the show that seeks to preserve the legacy of our journalism as well as celebrate the same. We are not at our normal location. We are just outside Pro Studios that is being run by my colleague, former colleague and friend, Mr. Paul Wafula. This is one man whose story we want to listen to and it has changed a lot of the works and how we do journalism in this country. From being sneaked into a military camp in Lanet to telling one story that would have the president cut short his speech to address the heat that that story had generated. Mr. Paul Wafula is one man that I honestly feel is very much underappreciated in journalism in this country. We are about to listen to his story and I'm glad that he could join the program. Asante sana, Mr. Paul Wafula. <laughs> yes, my brother. Hey, how, how are, are you? you? Uh, kizungu. <laughs> kizungu mzuri. <laughs> how are you doing, sir? I am well. I'm Wonderful. Well, I'm Good well. to see you, Bana. I'm yeah, looking at the things you guys are doing here at uh, at uh, at Pro Studios, and it's wonderful work. I mean, we we are a content uh, team. I've always been a content person, mm. and I believe uh, content is the biggest thing that really really exists in terms of a commodity in the world today. Mm. But most importantly, telling stories. Stories are, I mean, they're impactful mm. because they are the things that we live for. Mm. And stories have changed the world in many, many ways. So mm. I'm, I'm really a content person mm. and I love to tell stories. And here, even at Pro Studios, mm. we are preparing ourselves uh, for the next generation of storytelling, mm. uh, digital and, and, and just AI space and mm. seeing what else we can do mm. to be able to serve the bigger audience uh, that the world has presented to us. Mm. So with time I've seen that uh, most people who have done works in print want to focus more on print, starting up a website, running stories here and there, competing with um, big media houses in terms of that space, that online space. But I'm seeing something different at Pro Studios. I never thought you were this much into broadcast stuff. I mean, I've always been a multimedia journalist. Kaka um, uh, camera za, uh, za, za cinema. <laughs> yeah. uh, you see, yeah. the... The, the format, yeah. so, I mean, the needs of the audience just changes. Uh, they're not consuming as much print as they were consuming before because that's uh, basically done. But the consumption habits have changed. People mm. want a bit more videos, mm. a bit more graphics, and a bit more digital content mm. that, that they, can, they can appreciate, mm. a bit more to serve on their mobile phones. Mm. So because of that, you have to package your content in a format that is today's uh, uh, consumer mm. uh, so that you can serve the audience but I've mm. always looked at myself as a multimedia journalist mm. because all my big projects I've done have always had TV print uh, and mm. online presence I've mm. always done that so we are trying to figure out for mm. this kind of an audience how do we still tell stories in a format mm. that they can actually be able to appreciate and, mm. and, and just transition from probably mm. the daily radio that we are used to to podcast mm. and then we're also doing uh, documentaries mm. a big big documentaries are coming your way mm. and we're thinking about the biggest stories that we have seen in this country and in the region from economic to crimes and everything else but basically it will be about following the money and as you've always watched about my work is about mm. following the money mm. so we are going very big on on following the money and watch this place mm. uh, for what is about mm, yeah. by the way you guys what you're looking at right now is is a pro studios what this guy has been able to set up here at the heart of the city you are to not <laughs> You are, uh, you are renting out this this set or what's going on? Uh, I think in my other life, the other life that people have never appreciated is uh, I think uh, my mind is uh, creative in a way. Mm. Uh, so so the first time I, I wanted to start a studio because I was doing a, a, a project uh, for the nation then we were doing a podcast and a documentary on uh, one we call the toxic flow mm. and another one on uh, sport pesa or the betting crisis that mm. we had in mm. kenya mm. and i couldn't find a recording place that was good for you know that could present itself i mean or lay itself to my kind of uh, space i wanted so i said why can't i create my own space for it because i looked for weeks i couldn't find a place so i said let me figure out how to create a space that i can be comfortable working in and that this is what we are looking at mm. here 
at pro studios you'll mm. find me many times painting mm. so I, I when when my mind when i have a mind block or things like that i will be painting the studio mm. i try this color i try that yourself myself it works out sometimes fine sometimes mm. it's a disaster mm. i come the following day i don't like it i change it so mm. so people come and they ask me for instance many times have people have reached out to ask me for who has designed my studio uh. so so i just uh, I find that like a compliment because mm. I am not a real designer by training, mm. but I think I just like creating sets. So I, I imagine a set, I see how does it work, and then I try and piece. So if you look at Pro Studios, you find every mm. every section, every wall is actually a set. So you mm. find like I can create like 25 different sets mm. in a very small space. So mm. and I keep going. I want to get to a point where I can have like 50 or so sets mm. in the space that we are looking at, so mm. that I can transition and make it as versatile as possible to serve every need that I need from mm. the, the the school going kids to the adult and mature audience mm, yeah. mm. so and maybe the best place for this interview to have started by the way uh, an accomplished journalist like yourself uh, Kaka Wafula and uh, all these things you've done viewers would uh, want me to have started with this specific question so we can now start this interview okay and we can start it this way where did it all begin I mean uh, did you always want to become a journalist? How did this begin? I think um, early in the days, you know, when we were growing up, uh, there were there were very few careers that were on our table then. Mm. Um, I mean, there was either you're either a lawyer, mm. a doctor, mm. or the people that we saw then were either teachers or you, you understand. So, mm. so I somehow thought that I really maybe wanted to be a doctor, but then I realized I don't want really to be a doctor because of I uh, don't want to see problems and death and blood every day. <laughs> That's not mm. me. Yeah. And then I said, then I'll settle down on being a lawyer. So I, I grew up to some early days before, I mean, end of primary school, I saw myself as a lawyer. Mm. But when I went to high school, I realized I've actually been a storyteller all along. Because uh, at French School Come Singer, we had uh, what we call narratives. Uh, mm. Those are like a genre in, in drama. We had plays, narratives, dances, and you know, the drama festival. And narratives were just a hit so i was at the national uh, stage every year i was performing to the president the state house mm. it was every year we were winning at the national then it, re it occurred to me that i'm actually a storyteller so mm. i asked myself i want to do something i enjoy doing and what is that mm. so basically journalism i didn't mm. even think twice mm. um, i picked journalism for the first course that i selected i was picked and i started journalism mm. um but then when we were coming to the newsroom then, I did an interview at The Nation then, um, after my internship, and I had two options, either to become a Kiswahili, <laughs> a Taifaleo reporter, mm. or a business journalist. How did they even think about that? Uh, those were the op positions that were available then. Okay. So we were interviewing for the positions that were available, mm. and I, uh, I looked at Taifaleo is a brilliant publication, but I thought that's not what I want to do. Mm. The other thing that was instead was a was a business uh, a publication that was a business daily, mm. and I thought, okay, this is not really what I wanted to do then mm. in my mind. And I said, let me just try it mm. because there were fewer people who wanted to do business journalism, and I had been advised that for business journalism, if you can hack business journalism, then you might not struggle any other bit. Mm. So there it is. So my first job was actually at the business daily, mm. and. Uh, the, let me let me shock you. What year is this? That is uh, 2009. 2009. That's where I started. You have just left uh, campus. I campus. Was finished Masano University 2009 and Masano kitu yuko na with IT. With IT, yeah. the only university on the equator. <laughs> 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 A wonderful university for for real. With IT. There's not nothing much. Either you are dealing with books, yeah. you are in the forest, or you are dealing with monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so you've come to Nation. So I've come to Nation, and here I am. Uh, the first job I am is business journalism. Yes. And the biggest secret I had is that I was a student leader in Maseno. Mm. And uh, we looked at the course outline in first year. We had Economics 101 yeah. as one of the units that we were supposed to do. And I asked uh, my colleagues then, and my colleagues were like, this course is very tough. Mm. And you know, being a student leader or the class rep, you mm. have to represent what people really wanted. Yeah. So I, I lobbied my colleagues and they said, drop this thing. So I went to the, to the department and told them, we're not doing mm -hmm. economics 101. Unanimously. We are coming here to do journalism. Yes. <laughs> we are not doing math and economics. Yeah. You know how naive we were. Yes. So the, the department started pleading with us, guys, this, this economics 101 is a very important course for you guys. 
you know, um, we know why we have put it there. Mm. Yeah, but if you wanted to pick another course in another department, so mm. we picked creative arts because mm. it was easier. We wanted to pass exams anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so we dropped economics 101. Yeah. It was the biggest secret because my first job, I think God has, has his humor, mm. <laughs> was being a business journalist. And uh, I mean, apart from the commerce I had done in high school. Mm. Uh, so the following day, I was asked to go and report financials for Safaricom. Mm. Raw as it was, I couldn't know what revenues are, what... Financials in the Zilla Vitum Randikanga. Yes, financial report. So uh, it was financial results, I think, full year. Yeah. And I didn't understand what anything in those figures are saying. I didn't even know where the story is. So I went there very early in the morning, they were reporting at 7 a.m. And I sat there, watched uh, Michael Joseph make the presentation, <laughs> somebody else make the presentation, the chairman make the presentation to Zanganga then, I think. And I couldn't figure out where the story would be mm. like. Mm. At the 7 a.m., it was mm. the longest day in my life. And that was a splash <laughs> for the business daily because the results for Safaricom, the biggest company in East Africa, were always a splash. Your first assignment? First assignment, main assignment at the business daily. It was baptism by fire. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in the newsroom. I arrived and uh, and uh, and uh, and I was, they asked me what's the story. Mm. But now it's around ten o'clock, eleven o'clock. I'm wondering what to tell the story. I have mm. no idea where the story is. So I present what is in the press release. They tell me that's not the story. What are the results? What has changed? Mm. What are the important things? What should shareholders mm. really need to mm. know? I didn't know anything. So uh, because of that, I was asked to go back to Safaricom to do another intern. Mm -hmm. Find the story. <laughs> Find the story. So the editors were not uh, the kind of editors we have today. They were really tough, and I thank I thank God for them because mm -hmm. they trained us what it takes to do a good story, and mm -hmm. they wouldn't take anything but a but a story that is properly done, thinking about the audience. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Safaricom. You know, it was very embarrassing to go back and say, "Hey, I've not understood the story. Uh, story Please Gani. explain to me. Mm -hmm. I need these answers." Mm -hmm. So we went back, we sat down with an hour, uh, they were very kind, they took me through the numbers, I got like 10% of the elephant. Mm. <laughs> then I came back, and there we were, I had my first splash at the business daily. First week. First assignment. First splash. First splash. But it was the longest day. <laughs> longest uh, it day. It was the longest day, I can assure you. I left the newsroom around 10, 10, and I thought, I don't, this is not what I want to do. Mm. So fast forward, I decided that uh, because I've now learned the importance of understanding financials, mm. uh, eventually I went back to school. Mm. I did uh, uh, CPA, mm. CPK at Strathmore University. Mm. So I'm now a certified public accountant. Mm. And that's what made it easy for me to, to become an editor even for the business daily and mm. other things. So mm. it became easy to discuss financials, to follow the money, mm. to understand why these companies are collapsing, mm. why accountants are cheating, what mm. auditors are seeing, mm. and asking the right questions from Kenyan companies. Because mm. without being at the level where you can be able to understand what the ratios are, what the stories of the numbers are saying, then we'll all just be waiting, oh, Chumi has collapsed, what happened? Mm. Or Nakumat has gone down, what has happened? Mm. But the numbers are there, but nobody can tell what the numbers are saying. Nobody's going through the numbers, exactly. churning yeah. out the information, yeah. saving the numbers for what the story actually exactly. is here. Yeah. Ah, I see, and that's done where that's now why we call you CPA. Yeah, that's how CPA. It's not a joke. It's actually a. It's a, a true. It's CPA. a real. I sat in class. It's a real. Yes, it's a real CPA. CPA. Yes, I have. I have the papers. <laughs> I graduated. A uh, few people think that I made it up. But and you it can is bring actually. classmates. I can I have classmates. I have pictures. Uh, and Strathmore <laughs> is not just anywhere. You have to go. Uh, you have a dress code. Uh, you have to sit in class. You know spend some certain hours in class mm. and you can't just pass even if it's an external exam mm. you must be able to they have must certify that you've actually sat mm. the mm. requisite number of classes so uh there we are still at business daily when you're doing this so uh that was in between oh, so in, when mm. i was at at business daily um after maybe three or so years i felt i've had my 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 i mean this is a this is a, I need a new challenge. Mm. So I shifted from Business Daily to Daily Nation, sister mm. products, mm. but I just wanted to, to have a bigger view of things because at that point, just reporting the numbers were without the people and how it's affecting them became quite difficult. I really wanted to have an, an, an appreciation of, of what these numbers, if it's a budget, I wanted to really take it down to who it affects and stuff like that. Mm. So that, that platform was offered at the Daily Nation. I was there for, I think, um, a few a few years two or three years i became the deputy 
uh, uh, assistant business editor. Then I moved mm. uh, to the Standard. Mm. I went there as a special project and investigative reporter. Mm. I rose to a senior investigative reporter while at the Standard, mm. and, um, and 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 a weekend editor uh, mm. while at Standard. So mm. I basically now that's when I was able now to spread my financials to. Uh, investigative uh, kind of mm. skills. I mm. uh, actually went to South Africa for training. Mm. Uh, Amabungane, it's Mail and Guardian. Mm. Uh, it's called the Beatles. Eh? It's mm. a very good place for training financial journalism. So I was there for, for a few weeks and I, I learned with some of the best investigative journalists in terms mm. of just how to, to put together a solid story that will not have questions. Mm. Um, and, and, and from there, I went to the Times in London, mm. also sat through an investigative reporter for three months mm. and just understood how to do an international scale investigative project. Mm. And there I, I came back as a senior reporter at the Standard then and we did some brilliant journalism mm. uh, while it lasted. Mm, mm. <laughs> yes. And then so I came back to Nation mm. and fast forward I, I, I became, after a few years I became the editor for the Business Daily, mm. uh, which is a brilliant uh, newspaper that uh, reports serious issues in Kenya mm. and it set itself apart as the paper that actually focuses on nothing else but what is important for the country. Mm, yeah. mm, mm. And that's then where I see the art of financial investigative journalism, yes. which I want to say is very much lacking in our current um, uh, in our current journalism. Apart from the fact that uh, investigative journalism itself appears to me as if um, it's going lower and lower every day, it therefore would mean that even financial journalism has suffered a lot. I mean, Brian, if you are to be a serious financial journalist in this country, mm. you'll be reporting to two people, either government, mm or companies. 90% of your stories will be uh, uh, unraveling the scandals that are in this country. And I can assure you, uh, even some of these blue chip companies that have this brilliant corporate governance uh, reports that they issue every year. And now, right now, even we are in the season of sustainability report where there's all this PR bullshit about, you know, how companies are very sustainable. Some of these companies are the most corrupt, and Kenyans know it, suppliers know it. Mm. Uh, they have dealt with these companies, and the corruption, even in the corporate uh, space in Kenya, is quite a serious problem. Uh, so then you have government, you know. Uh, so if you are to follow the money, as so to speak, you will have, I think you will spend your entire career. You will never finish. You will never finish the stories that are there to be told. The problem again now that you find yourself in is that, and as much as you have the big, beautiful stories that really Kenyans really want to know what has happened, mm. they are the same people who are spending money on advertising. Mm. So if it's a big company that's advertising with you, government today uses a, uh, advertising as a stick. They can decide whom to advertise with. And if they take away government advertising from a media house, you basically struggle because 60%, 50% mm. of revenues for many media houses in Kenya at government. Uh, mm. Uh, related, somebody taking away half of your revenues, you will surely struggle mm. because of one story. Mm. It will not be worth it for a shareholder. So mm. you better not have the journalist, or better not have the story mm. than lose fifty percent of government advertising, for mm. instance. So that is where you are seeing weaknesses in financial journalism in Kenya. It's not about not having journalists. We have some of the best journalists in Kenya. I'm actually also the president of the Financial Journalist Society of Kenya. Mm. We have one hundred and thirty plus members and we have brilliant journalists in there mm. who some of them whose stories cannot just find the platform mm. because the space is so thin and advertisers are very vicious uh, to allow uh, stories out mm. so that's what is uh, that's that's what is happening yes yes and they're able to maneuver their way into the newsrooms I mean, they're there, they have big budgets on, uh, on, on public relations companies. You mm. see, the challenge, which is a good and a bad thing, is that uh, for professional media, you are required to get a right of reply. But this now has been turned into a weapon, because mm. when you go out to seek a right of reply, you'll be, of course, asked to send an email with the questions of the answers mm. you're looking for. Mm. Um, so once you do that, they can definitely tell the story that you want to write. 
they don't have to wait for you to write the story. So mm -hmm. immediately they get those questions, they start firefighting. And they'll fight you viciously. Mm. So they'll never respond to the questions on time, but they'll make sure that they're either calling the CEO, calling the tour director, calling other editors above you to make sure that that story does not. People go as high as calling the chairman of the board. Mm. I've received so many times board directors, board members mm. calling me of a story. And uh, I mean, I've had some interesting story. A very distinguished board director called me mm. and asked me not to run a story. Mm. And ask them what is the problem with this story and we are coming there uh, we are actually yeah, coming yeah, to so talk about that yeah. can we talk about that because i also remember when i broke the story of the edible oil scandal yeah. it, it was vicious I mean, it, 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 things, <laughs> things were bad <laughs> and the scandal is there people know what happened things were yeah. things are bad things know what happened things everybody are, knows uh, yeah, but they wouldn't bad. let you yeah so while that then uh, it means that uh, Economically, it would make sense for Media House not to run a story because then they'll be inviting losses. I mean, look at uh, today, the Standard Group has, has just announced their results and they're in the red. The red, their losses have increased by about another 10, 15 million. Mm. So you're looking at more than 120 million loss. Mm. Yeah. Um, the nation announced their results. They were not also so good. Uh, they have been in the loss making for the first time in uh, more than 20 years. Mm. Uh, you, you don't want to lose money right now as a mm. media house uh, mm. because the advertisers are fewer and fewer. The cake is being shared by so many other people mm. and you have bills to pay and mm. you have shareholders, remember. So I, I, I don't sympathize with, with media because it's a, it's, it's a tricky situation mm. because on one side you have shareholders that you must respond to and on the other side, you want to allow journalism to thrive. It's mm. a, I mean, it's it's a very it's difficult a difficult situation. combination yeah. to, to, to 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 have. Exactly, it's a difficult place. You to win be. one and you lose the other. Either mm. you have good stories mm. and disappoint the advertiser, mm. who is uh, the revenue, mm. and then who that means that you disappoint the shareholder, who will fire you mm. if you don't meet their targets. Mm. Mm. So you either keep your job by making sure the shareholder is happy. And then uh, you let some stories uh, mm. <laughs> be told another day. Mm. <laughs> there's always another time. Yes, there's always another time. So, mm. so you have to survive first to be mm. able to keep journalists and then mm. be able to tell the stories later. Mm. When I heard the story of the NHIF heist back in 2018, I was at KTN and uh, uh, then someone came and splashed some 30 million shillings worth of advertising. A senior editor told me, there will always be another time to tell the story. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's what happens. Uh, I mean, we have had interesting situations. You have even promoted a story yeah. for a week. Yeah. This story is coming over the weekend. <laughs> you have, but then on Friday you are told, by the way, this story, uh, we can tell it another time. Yeah. You know, because it's not about that the story is not factual. Mm. It, you've tied everything that needs to be tied. You have reached out to the other side. You have mm. your documents. You have your evidence. Mm. You have sources. You have corroborated. You know, you followed everything in the book, mm. but then you are told uh, this one will just die a financial, mm. a financial death mm. because we have read and mm. can we wait for this story another day? Let's do it some other time. Yeah. Then I, I also realized then that with time you also did some other stories that may have been outside financial journalism. They may have been outside business investigations. Uh, toxic flow, uh, other stories like uh, scars, scars of war, yes, scars of war. Yeah. That was back at, at, uh, at, at standard. At then. the standard. Yeah. And I'm, so, were you then realizing that there were other better stories or easier stories? Well, there are no easier, <laughs> there are no easier stories. It, it is. It is actually just following the money. Mm -hmm. um, I believe when you follow the money, you get to wherever the story leads you. So it can be a crime story, it can be an environment story, it can mm -hmm. be a health story, mm -hmm. but it has an implication somewhere mm -hmm. in terms of who is getting and who is losing the money. Mm -hmm. So most of my stories, if you watch them carefully, you'll realize there is a money element that they were born. Let me give you an example or two. Mm -hmm. um, let's take the scars of war story. Mm -hmm. Tell it from the budget mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So Amazon was supposed to be paying Kenyan soldiers some amount. Mm -hmm. So we went to Somalia and while we were there, the military guys were showing us the good work they had done there, they, they were building hospitals, they were doing community work after taking over Kismayu and things like that. We went to their cafeteria. The meals were good, really. They were really good meals. I was wondering how they were able to 
bring such fresh meals mm. uh, in such a difficult place, how the meals were making mm. it there. And then while we were having a meal, one of the soldiers opened up and said, hey, my guy, you guys are just being, you are being lied to. Mm. The biggest problem is in Nairobi. Mm. Our f- colleagues are dying and they're not being compensated. Mm. Why don't you investigate? So I checked the budget. I saw how much money that Amazon was supposed to have paid. I asked my guys at Treasury. They said the money has been released, half of it at least. But on the other side, the widows were not getting the money. Mm. So we traveled. So it started from the budget space. So we went all the way. We traveled like 14, 15 counties mm. just to look for the military widows then to speak to their guys. Young men who had been taken to Somalia had lost their lives. And here the compensation, some, you know, some military chiefs or whoever they were, they were sitting on their money or the pension guys were sitting on their money. It was such a chaotic problem. So to be able to put this story into context was to see, to seek what has happened to the guys who have come back alive. Mm. So at that time, early in the days, there were probably now things have changed. During those days, there was no PTSD counseling that was efficient to solve mm. their problems. Mm. It was a really rushed process and guys were coming, they were howling at night and stuff like that. Mm. So our good friends at, uh, at Lanet sneaked us in, mm. into the military barracks. I think that was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. I always think about it and I said, mm. what if I was caught inside there? Mm. Peter up and Numa, Peter yeah. up and Numa. So they sneaked us in. Inama. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it is not easy to sneak into a military barrack. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But Kenyans are patriotic. Yeah. And they, if they know what you are standing for, they will actually do it for you. So we, we were sneaked into a barracks. I went with my recorder. Mm. And uh, uh, so we, I stayed behind the shadows. Uh, there are some places that are safe to go. I stayed there until at night. Then I was taken to, to a room just outside next to a room where the soldiers were being confined mm. and they were there they were howling the whole night guys were relieving the military i mean the, the the fights in somalia it was very like you know it was really really painful to be there so i recorded and and and, and this was basically we never aired it this was basically for for us to be able to prove our case that we have actually been able to see and experience the real problems that military men are going through after somalia mm. so when we came back now we, we had a story to tell about um, about the, the the scars of war and it was a brilliant story of course kdf were up in arms we mm. almost mm. Uh, military police were sent to, to standard group to arrest us mm. and uh, at some point some of our cameramen were ambushed and they were their cameras were picked and all the footage confiscated and destroyed mm. but we were able to recover quite some significant footage to allow us to tell the story in a way that changed and helped the military widows mm. be compensated and also set, set in motion a plan to actually do proper guiding and counseling. Mm. And also open the coffers here, the pension house, to really know the problems that their guys are going through, which mm. I suspected they knew, but because it wasn't their problem, they mm. just sat on it. Mm. The second story maybe I can mention is the Toxic River. People mm. think it's an environment project. Yes, mm. it is. Mm. But it started from the budget once again. Mm. At that time, I think when we were doing the Nairobi River project, and then it became such a big project for the country, mm. I was looking at the budget, and I think there was three or four billion that had been allocated in the sanitary, uh, in the sanitation uh, budget, mm. and then you had uh, the Mil- Ministry of uh, Water and Sanitation, who at the time uh, saw the money taken away from them uh, during the supplementary budget when they reorganized the budget. So I asked myself. How important sanitation for this country that even the 4 billion shillings that was put there had been taken away. So of course we went back to the newsroom and told them sanitation budget 4 billion. Nobody will care about such a story because uh, we are talking about a budget of 2 trillion. So what is 4 billion? Four billion? Mm. You know, what, is, what is so important about this? So give us a story that can make sense. So that's how we started the Toxic Flow project. I visited the University of Nairobi, discussed with some uh, um, uh, professors there. Uh, I mean, they were brilliant guys, Professor Mbari and his team. And they helped me shape a story that will make Kenya care about sanitation. Mm, mm. So they said the only way of telling that story is to follow Nairobi River because Nairobi River is the biggest disaster for Kenya that at that time people were not paying attention to. So all the pollution, all the waste, if you look at the pictures that we got from that, like there are so many slums that are basically defecating in the river. and. Mm. So they asked us to look for a small budget to allow them to take us out to test what is, in the, what is actually coming into the rivers. Mm. So we started from Ondiri Springs here in uh, Kikuyu, Kikuyu mm. and followed the river all the way down to, 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 to Kilifi, mm. um, uh, where the river actually exits into, into, the, Indian. into the Indian Ocean. Mm. 
and so we were picking samples, bit fish. You know, there are some places where you find fish, uh, abuya, is just on the river banks, and guys are like, mm. they go and sell the fish. They don't mm. understand the connection between the toxicity of the water, mm. just killing the fish, mm. and what's what they are seeing. So then they say they don't even fish. They just go and pick the fish and come and sell. And some of us buy the fish on the road. Mm. Uh, you find and I went a place like Kath River here. Oh, I mean, just starting from uh, the Fourteen Falls. You find the water is really bad. But down the road, uh, you find farms, very beautiful farms. Uh, the women there were telling me that they only need to pump water to their... So they just buy a pump, pump the water to their lands that were dry up, up, up lands. And they'll have these biggest managus that you can never get. Mm. And they were saying this place is very fertile. They never correlated between the, the toxicity or the poison or the waste in the waters. To the to, fertility, to the fertility <laughs> equation that they had there. Yeah. And you know where the, the you know where the the, the managu goes mm -hmm. ends up. Mm -hmm. They bring it back here to Nairobi. Mm. So in the morning, you come back wherever you know these fresh big managu mm -hmm. that people are buying. Mm -hmm. They is coming from this from this fertile lands, and mm. they are basically you know feed, feeding our own shit that is second down there. <laughs> Would you say that was the biggest story then you worked on? I, I think, think the, I think the the, it, the it broadcast was, version was, was done by. I mean, I worked with three journalists. I worked with Sheila Sendeo. Mm. There was, um, I think, uh, Charity, Charity Mwangi. Yeah. Uh, another version of it. Mm. So, because the story was very big and mm. guys really appreciated it, we mm. went to do Lake Victoria as mm. well. So, we worked on an East African project again. We picked the same scientists, walked around Lake Victoria, down from the Gori where there's a gold smelting and all the things happening, mm. went all the way to Jinja. Mm. and picked around 50 sites that we went and picked sediments. Mm. In Kisumu we found some guys from the fisheries department who were very nice. They took us inside mm. and we understood the problem of tilapia in Kenya. It's mm. not about just uh, that it's disappearing, it's the toxicity that the river is. Because many factories in Kisumu and elsewhere they're just, you know, polluting the, the side of the lake, mm. the Kenyan side of the lake. So you see, uh, tilapia I was made to understand really is a, is a kind of breed that likes fresh fresh, fresh water yeah so it, so our tilapia disappeared went to the ugandan side because it's, it's fresher than on our mm. side mm. So that's why you can see the megingo side where guys are fighting because we don't have tilapia on this side but all our fish has gone to uganda mm. that is safer and then there's also the problem of um, our fishing problems where the nets we don't have the nets and stuff uganda had put military on the lake to make sure that you don't use the wrong side net sizes so they are capture the wrong size exactly. of the fish Mm. You don't need to capture the small fish, you know, because it's still growing. You mm. need to only capture a certain size, mm. and the nets dictate. So for us, we pick even the smallest nets. So we put them in the water, so we overfish, mm. and then we don't have fish on this side. So we start going to Uganda, and that's mm. how we start fighting. And we are told that we are being kicked out by Ugandan soldiers or military, or mm. we have migingo problems. But it was an issue of pollution. Mm. The story was actually pollution, but has caused all these problems. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that was the biggest story. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Was it wasn't the biggest story because I also remember there are other stories uh, you together with others have also worked on that were equally big. Do you consider that the biggest story or the or the military? Maybe, maybe the readers can, can judge. Mm. Uh, from impact, I feel this was a very important national story. Mm. Uh, but we also had the Railway to Nowhere, mm. the story of uh, the Standard Cage Railway. Mm. I think... Uh, it uh, from impact and the feedback that we received mm. it was one of the biggest stories in this country uh, because it was difficult to find the the the, the contract mm. for the, the sgr in kenya i mean i can't tell how we got it because mm. it will <laughs> put some guys in trouble mm. but once we got the contract things mm. were were very difficult for us because the minute government realized we have the actual copy of the standard gauge railway it was a problem. We mm. didn't run the story for six months, just kept it. Because first, we were not sure if we'll be safe, two, we were not sure if the sources that had given us those access to those documents to photocopy would be safe in terms of their jobs and stuff. So mm. we kept it for six months, we never touched it. And then when we were sure that everybody else was safe, then we unleashed the stories. Mm. And then you remember there was a the Behind the Walls project, which was about um, how Kenyans um, are being mistreated by the Chinese during the building of the railway. Mm. So it's a build up of the Standard Gauge mm. Railway then. Uh, so people can read the story, but it was one of the best stories I ever did. Uh, why, why, why did we call it railway to, to, to nowhere? And why was this contract very important? 
I mean, uh, I've been, I'll show you some pictures. I've been to the, the last place where the railway ended, mm. and it's nowhere really. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's nowhere because, you know, when you build a railway, make it terminate somewhere. Yeah. Stop it at a town where people can actually alight. Yeah. And then do their stuff. Mm. Even if it's cargo, you must put it somewhere where people can actually. So, from our ne- from our last point, what was called my mahi, which is not really my mahi, but mm. just part of my mahi, mm. um, the railway also was built mm. some other 15, 20 kilometers, you know, deep into towards Narok. Mm. And it was abandoned somewhere in between because either we ran out of funds or something. If you look at that place, it's actually nowhere. They have actually closed it. So many Kenyans have only arrived or reached to you know where the station is because mm. that's where they get. But if you follow the line, it is actually gone further than that. So mm. it's actually in the wilderness, mm. and people are actually now vandalizing it because now nothing moves there. There are bridges like four or five bridges that have been vandalized. Uh, you know the railway material is quite quite pricey for scra- for scrap metal uh, mm. dealers. So they have basically been lifting this thing and mm. you know, selling it. And so Kenyans have lost money mm. by this kind of plan of building it to nowhere. Mm. So that's how we call it Railway to Nowhere, because it doesn't end anywhere, mm. uh, particularly. Mm. Uh, but also the other stories behind it. And mm. then um, why the contract was important, because we wanted to understand three things. One, how much are we really spending on this, this contract? Two, we wanted to understand um, what are the conditions that we have given for this loan, mm. okay? And three, what are the things that we are paying for? Because sometimes, you, if, you, if you look at roads, biggest scandals are in the road industry today. Mm, mm. You look at the project in terms of the road. You know, a contractor, you'll be seeing, they'll do maybe 15 bridges on this road. They'll have road markings. They'll have whatever side, mm. side roads for maybe trucks to park. Mm. They'll have all these things. Mm. And then, when you look at the final road that has been built in this country, it is very far from what was given. So Kenyans just look at the big deal of, oh, we've launched the railway. So we wanted to understand what was signed. Mm. And then we followed the line to know if they said 15 bridges, are these bridges done? Where are these bridges supposed to be? Are they to the same time or they have cut corners? Because contractors cut corners a lot. Mm. And especially for a railway that is being built part of it in the, in the, in the game reserve or game park, it's easy for you to cut corners and nobody will know. Mm. So we wanted to really establish that. And most importantly, the cost that Kenyans are going to pay for mm. for this for this railway because mm. it was really hit and nobody would tell us how much mm. how much they were being paid. So that is why we really wanted to find out. Mm. And I have not known um, more pain as a journalist than reporting the railway. Mm. <laughs> why uh, so? I think it was a paid project for government then, mm. and there are so many people on the eating line along the line all the way down that you don't want to disrupt the flow of funds um, and I think the Chinese contractors knew what they needed to do so there's a lot of money around so personal attacks were I mean if you check online some of them are still there mm. they were every time you did a standard Kijerelo story you will be attacked 48 hours personal stuff people will make up things and just discourage you that was very vicious anytime you did a proper railway story and they kept coming so we'll do one they attack we do another one, they attack, we do another one until Kenyans realize we're actually saying the truth. And um, that's how we got our way out mm. of it. Mm. So the one, I think, the one that made the president very angry then when we titled the Radio to Nowhere, mm. um, we, I think the story coincided with the launch <laughs> mm. of uh, another part of the railway. Mm. And they were also launching the, 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 some road here in Nairobi. And there we were, we went to town with the Radio to Nowhere. Mm. And it was a bad day in the newsroom. Mm. That's all I can say. <laughs> Is it the one uh, a CEO was saying he was seated next to to, to somebody and the, the, the paper? <laughs> <laughs> so that is the second one. That one is the one for what we called uh, we called the behind the walls. Mm. That was published by the nation, by the standard. Mm. And then there's this other one for for for, for relative to nowhere mm. that was published by the nation. Mm. So the one for the behind the walls, yeah. for some strange reason, these stories always came out at the wrong time in quotes. Mm. Uh, because when we were publishing the behind the walls, yeah. this was a story about racism. Yeah. So, I mean, I heard about racism and I wondered, how can Kenyans allow this? Mm. You know, they are being caned or they are being asked to lie down or being punished. Like, this I don't think it's true. 
I, can't be. I, I, I could think that Kenyans can allow that to happen to them. Mm. But there I was. I went in. I got a job as a translator for two weeks at the St. Gage Railway. I went in and took pictures and saw for myself mm. what was happening in there. Mm. And I came and put, put out this story that really shook everyone. It was mm. really, and they were asking for evidence. The pictures are still there online. People can see them. Mm. I mean, it was really, really sad. Kenyans lying down, being whatever, being caned when they're late. Kenyans eating different places, being treated differently mm. from the Chinese colleagues. Mm. Kenyans earning like a tenth of what Chinese contractors were earning, yet they were doing more. We had Kenyan engineers, guys very well qualified. So mm. tell me, uh, Brian, mm. Kenyans fly even KQ mm. to the US. Yeah. What is so hard about uh, driving the, 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 the train the from train Mombasa, to, Mombasa to Nairobi and it's such a, an automatic thing? Mm. What is so difficult? You understand? Yes. So there is everything wrong about how the contract and the operation of the standard gauge was done. Mm. It was done to make Kenyans look like they don't know what they're doing. Yes. You'll find a qualified engineer doing a desk job mm. and taking instructions from an engineer from China mm. who did an online course. They, mm. Some of them have done uh, some logistics or transport course in an online university and you have an engineer here who has done six, five years mm. and has training or four, five years experience mm. who is being given instructions because, mm. I mean, this is Kenyan, the other one is Chinese and the pay disparity was painful to actually look at the pay slips. Mm. But fast forward now after we did that story, uh, what happened is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, the Standard Gauge Railway or Kenya Railways had sponsored the Standard Group then mm. on a 50 year anniversary. Mm. And so what that happens is that we give all, like free newspapers or they have paid for newspapers yeah. for, for that day. So we put the newspaper in, on the train. Every seat on the train mm. had uh, the standard newspaper. Mm. And on that day is when we released this big, big story mm. about the Chinese mistreatment of Kenyan workers. Mm. And it was a front page story and it had taken at least two spreads in the, story, in the newspaper. Mm. And Chinese have basically paid for this because they are sponsoring. Mm. So they expected very brilliant, rosy, wonderful stories of you know how they are they are changing Kenya, how they are creating jobs. And then here you are, they have paid money mm. for newspapers. And here we have the biggest scandal of the day. It's in the standard, and everybody's reading about it. I think the first. Yes, that was the first scandal that was done very well about that guys, the Chinese operations. And, so and the CEO is in that. Now the CEO was, he was supposed to hand over the newspapers. The Sonar CEO. So that one was supposed to say, thank you very much, guys, for this partnership. Moja, moja. Moja, moja. We are mm. celebrating 50 years. And then when he sees the front page, so the newspaper side is appearing in the coach. But the guys who were there had already read it because uh, the story was. So, you know, they had put on every, on every seat. So yes. by the time they ran to remove a few, people had already picked almost Who was half. removing them? But when they realize <laughs> the story is not <laughs> going to help. <laughs> so, so the CEO then thought it was sabotage and <laughs> it was just a bad day. It was just a, bad, it was just a coincidence. We didn't plan it, but it just happened. Who was removing the newspapers from the seats? This, this, the, the hostesses of the of the of the Twenty Gazetti. Twenty Gazetti is at Malaysia. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so they were running around because now the launch and then you see now. The problem is that, you know, the cabin, every cabin, you know, your passengers enter, whatever, whatever. So mm. it's not easy for you to move from the first to the last. Yeah. To remove all those newspapers, <laughs> it's impossible. And by the time you get to the, to the, <laughs> to get to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, what they call cattle class or the, because yeah. <laughs> many guys, uh, the CEO, of course, was seated in the first class. Mm. Uh, and now more people are seated in the other side. Yeah. So we are celebrating, you know, Standard was celebrating 100 years, and these guys had sponsored yeah. the celebration. Mm. And there we are with the worst story that, that mm. we will have chosen. It was a nightmare. The mm. CEO came back to the newsroom, mm. and he was not talking. He was <laughs> shaking his head. Guys, why did you pick today? Yeah. What is it? <laughs> uh, he told him there was nothing personal. Yeah. But uh, journalism has those days. Mm. And then this other one, also coincidentally, it happened on the day when the president was actually launching Re or relaunching. Before you proceed, you know, there yeah. were all coincidences. From where I sit, there were coincidences. But they hit the nail on the head because they happened at the right time. Mm. This one so of the railway to nowhere, yeah. we actually planted it in a way. Mm. 
because we knew they are launching yeah. the project on this day. Yeah. And State House had really been very coy about the details. But somebody there told us they are launching on this day. So we said we ran the story then because we had done the project. Mm. So we were still finding an excuse to run it because timing is also important. Mm. So we realized the launch is today. We said let us run it on the day when they are launching. Mm. So the president woke up in the morning. They have you know, prepared, they have put carpet, red carpet and everything else. And the story there is yellow to nowhere. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they had planned to launch it in five places. He said it's not going. Same railway. So, yeah, same railway. Yeah. So he said no, he's not going to launch it. Wait, he was launching the railway. So there was a second version of the railway. So you know they built they had built Nairobi to I mean Mombasa to Nairobi. Nairobi, yeah. So the president was now launching the the Nairobi to 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 my to my Mahio Naivasha. Mm. Uh, I think it was the ICD. They had built most of it, so mm. they were launching either the ICD or the operations of mm, mm. part of the railway, which was now the cargo section. Mm. And then we woke up with the railway to nowhere. So he cancelled all the all the launches that they had planned, and he said he does not want journalists from Nation. So all Nation journalists are then were locked out from the launch. Mm. They and were? Then, yeah, they were. We, we, we couldn't. They were, we were told not to go. Mm. And then now we went to... So when we went, we were told not to, not to go near. Because we are we are bad people, and then uh, of course he launched uh, the road, and then went to to my mahi. So when he arrived there, it was just a lecture. This is not nowhere. This is a big place. My mahi is not a nowhere. It's a place with people. Mm. So he tried to do PR about it, but the point had been made, mm. and so the story was picked up by everyone. It went to national media, and it became a nightmare. Mm. So they had to come back and figure out another PR strategy of how to position the my the 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 Naivasha ICD as an important st mm. uh, story. But you knew what happened in Naivasha. We, that story cannot be told because of uh, uh, how hot it was then. But mm. uh, but yes, the Naivasha launch was for other reasons, not necessarily because it was a viable project. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, mm. have you been on the railway between here and uh, and uh, and Maimahi or Suswa? I haven't. I mean, you, you, you travel that line, then mm. you'll be shocked. Mm. <laughs> Because it used to, I think it started five days, then went to three or two days. Mm. Now I don't know if they go once a week, mm. and, and who is on that on that line. Mm. Yeah, because basically they didn't do the math of who is who. The need, you know, we have Kenyans here who need commuter rail. Mm. In big population areas, there's no rail. And then Nairobi put, Kisumu. Yeah, then you put it in a place where there are no, there are no, there are basically no commuters or there are no passengers. Mm. So it's a, it's really an investment but in the wrong place. Mm, mm, mm. So it, it, the second one was more or less of, uh, of a planned publication. The second one, we looked for the time. Mm. <laughs> the first uh, one? The first one was a coincidence. Yeah. We didn't know that uh, the commercial guys at, at Standard had planned for this. Uh, had sold, had the, sold the, 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 the paper. The paper. Mm. We didn't know. Mm. As we were on the tour side just doing our job, mm. getting stories. <laughs> And so that Chinese wall that day mm. served its purpose, where mm. the commercial side and uh, the tourist side did not speak to each other. And that's the way a newsroom is supposed to be. Unaingiza watu na gazeti. Amo umekelea kubitu. Unapatia watu gazeti na yoyo gazeti na kulima. Na umu melipia. Yoyo gazeti na kumaliza. You have failed for this spot to finish you. Basically, it was a bad day. It was a bad day, but those are the days in the newsroom. So I think I think that then there was a betting betting story. I think for me it was very personal because mm. we were challenged to produce evidence that um, that uh, somebody can commit suicide because of betting. Mm. I mean, how do you? This was the story you, of um, sport pesa. Yes, sport pesa and just the betting industry. Mm. Uh, basically, it had become a bad thing for Kenyans because mm. if you went anywhere, even for you went to a garage, you'll find your mechanics, mm. even your car wash guys who are betting. One mm. hour and they're not actually doing work. We went to University of Nairobi, students were actually they're in class and you know, they're checking if they've won the bet or not. Mm. Uh, but then now it became such a serious problem because guys were losing a lot of money mm. and some of the money is not theirs. So we started seeing a lot of suicides, especially young Kenyans, mm. university students. Kenyatta, we had several, we had, you know. So we tracked down these families, you know. Um, we found at least five families uh, where guys had taken the wrong bet and they had lost money and I mean these guys thought that the best way out is to just commit suicide. Mm. So we went to the graves, looked at their messages in terms of um, uh, where they were betting, how much money they had lost, how they, you know, 
even the obituaries we looked at uh, at the police reports then in terms of what police were saying mm. in the investigation of the cause of death mm. we spoke to those who were married their families their neighbors you know and we were able to piece together that 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 story that mm. that actually brought some attention to what was happening in betting and it went all the way to London mm. i think some of the betting companies were investigated and there were a lot of issues that came up mm. some were discovered to be not paying full taxes mm. and there was a bit of regulation so mm. betting is still there it's good mm. but they had let it to go a bit too far mm. Mm. yeah mm. 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 the billions bullets, bullets and, yeah. bravado. and bravado you should read that story it was a wonderful yeah, story yeah, yeah. I, I read it. I remember th there was actually a broadcast version of it. <laughs> I only wanted to discuss it, yeah. but uh, we went to court. Yeah. Of course, we were sued, mm. and uh, part of we did like four parts. Mm. We did also uh, a podcast, eight eight episodes, mm. and uh, I think they went to court then and uh, got some order. Sometimes courts uh, issue some orders mm. that you suspend publishing of one or two stories mm. until the matter is hard and determined. Mm. So one or two of those pro projects were suspended from mm. publishing, mm. but we had done four episodes. Mm. Okay, but mm. uh, when the court has its day, then mm. they will come back online. I, mm. I hope so. But uh, we did some brilliant journalism. But the rest of the stories are still there, mm. and people can check. I mean, we have Julia Smalley. Mm. We're talking about Julia Smalley today, but they can go and read the stories we did there, mm. and uh, the stories are there in terms of what we wrote eight years ago have come to pass. Mm. Uh, we also went to court, of course, he went to court and got some orders. I'm not sure which judge gave the orders, mm. but uh, that's one, one, of the, one of the ways where journalism is actually put uh, to task because somebody can go to court and seek orders to, 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 to have a certain story unpublished before a matter is hard and determined. Mm. And because of, uh, I mean, uh, some judges feel that it's easier for you for the story to be unpublished, then have it published and, and then it injures somebody. Mm. Now the problem with that uh, determination is that once that order is given, then these guys stop pushing. Mm. The, I mean, they don't attend court. The mm. lawyers always come, excuses. So there's a case I've had with maybe the Mumia Sugar stories that we did mm. six, seven years ago. Mm. It's never been concluded. It's still there. And the stories were uh, not published. Mm. I mean, some of them pulled were, down. were pulled down because of a court order. Mm. So they just don't go past. Once they get the orders that they want, then they find a way around court to make sure that the matter mm. is always pushed eight months, six months. So by the time your lawyers prepare that you are going for a hearing, then it's cancelled. Maybe the the lawyer is not available. Somebody is sick, or the judge is not available. Mm. It's always that, and you'll be in court for six years, mm. and the story will never be anywhere mm. so that is the biggest risk that we have as uh, mm. from a court a litigation perspective so if i hear you right you're saying that uh, to a greater extent there are people who've learned our co our our justice system there yes. are people who have understood our justice system and that this justice system has also been used to curtail the free uh, flow of information media freedom and curtail real journalism in this country because then i was thinking why don't they then seek orders to expedite the case i mean if you have been injured mm. or you feel you have been defamed don't you want damages you do so you want the case to move very fast mm. but how come if you have cases where the person who was sued is not available for hearing mm. for some strange reason the cases you know Every like there's a case we were there's one case I don't want to mention because it's in court. Mm. Uh, we have prepared to go to court four times this mm. year, mm. and we have never made it to court. Mm. So you go, you have a debrief with your lawyers. You're told you are going tomorrow. You'll be appearing in Milimani at this time. Uh, please come. You have looked at your affidavit. You've signed it. Everything is solid. Mm. Then in the morning you're told this matter will not be heard today. Mm. It's, it's reached basically the hearing stage. So. There were these preliminaries where the objections here and there, they took another two, three years. Now we are going to hearing stage. Mm. But they are not showing up mm. or they are finding excuses. So I would think that this, there are some uh, people who have actually mastered how courts work mm. and they are using it to their advantage. Maybe mm. judges are in on it or not or they don't know what's happening. Mm. But once they get the orders that they want, they very viciously pursue the orders. the orders of stop publishing until this matter is hard and determined. Even promos? Yes, even promos. I they saw the good down. story that uh, 
Edmond Nyabola. And I remember that time I was at KTN and we had a similar story. Hussein Mohammed uh, was our investigations uh, editor at the time uh, at, at KTN News. And we had a similar story like the, uh, the, about the Child Welfare Society. Yeah. I mean, that happens because uh, they have basically understood the court process. Mm. So I can assure you I have like uh, eight or so mm. active cases in court, mm. but I've been lucky I've never lost a, a case in court uh, from a defamation or a story that is uh, not properly done because mm. Before you go to press, I think you need to have your evidence and right. And so when the orders come, you always prepare for that. Mm. You ask yourself, if somebody were to go to court to stop this story or to sue you, mm. what is the evidence or what is it that you want to use in court? Mm. Mm. So you make sure that whatever it is that you need mm. is available before you publish. So whenever there is a, a demand or something, you quickly work with your lawyers within mm. and prepare and mm. rush to court mm. but most of the time because they are the ones uh, i mean the complainant to the other side is the one who feels aggrieved mm. uh, there's a tendency of uh, a judge feeling that let's suspend the story mm. until we hear the both sides of the mm. matter to know mm. if this person has been defamed mm. or not because if they have not then you can still publish your story mm. but uh, then if it takes five years or six years in court then mm. the story has been overtaken by events if it's a company that people are stealing from it's already collapsed mm. if it's a county that governor or whoever has already left, it's gone to another place like management has changed or they have basically covered their tracks. So five years, six years is too much time for even you as a journalist to keep following a story because it's, mm. they're going to take your time in mm. court, waste your time swearing affidavits, mm. ask you to provide things that sometimes uh, put your sources at risk mm. uh, and, and it becomes difficult to, to so, operate. So basically the intention here is uh, the advice from their legal teams has always been, now that the story is already out, yeah. The only thing we can do is to take the story away. Yes. Let's get these orders. Yeah. You know. I think that's the plan. Mm. That's, that's what they do. And mm. they have succeeded to a very mm. significant degree. Mm. Uh, but sometimes you find one good judge that uh, tells them off. Mm. Uh, but all those hot stories always have a legal implication. So you mm. have to be prepared for it. Mm. Um, and, and, and so for us, it's a matter of evidence. Mm facts and if you're doing an investigative story you better have your facts right because mm. you can talk to somebody today and tomorrow they tell you that you never spoke to them mm. so you must make sure that you have enough information to prove that you actually spoke to them mm. and you see it's not legally sound for you to record somebody who has not agreed to be recorded mm -hmm. so if they refuse to be recorded mm. and then they say they never spoke to you the following day mm. you have to figure out as a journalist how you're able to prove that you actually spoke to that person mm. and your recording will be inadmissible even in court because they mm. say don't record me mm. so you must produce an recording that shows mm -hmm. you actually ask them mm -hmm. to record and you record it if mm -hmm. you don't if you don't record them mm -hmm. then they'll have problems from mm -hmm. just the substantive areas you'll find a lot of evidence being watered down mm -hmm. and then in evidence in court might be a bit difficult mm -hmm. or different from mm -hmm. the evidence in the court of public opinion mm -hmm. <laughs> I read yeah. somewhere uh, I read somewhere that uh, nation media group pushed you out and uh, I'm trying to imagine um, you have been a fine journalist all through. You have done these powerful stories. I know those are blogs and they are bloggers and they, they, they have stories to write. Sometimes they write things that are correct. Sometimes they write things that are, that are false. They have written things about myself. And almost everyone in, in public life. And um, I find that you are in the public life and for those who think you are not, then maybe your stories are, are, are in public. Railway to Nowhere was touched on all of us. Did Nation Media Group push you out the way I've read? Uh, that's a very interesting question, uh, Obuya. You want to put me on the spot? Yeah. I, I left. I parted with Nation. Yeah. Uh, people leave for many reasons, mm. okay? Mm. Um, uh, I had a different view of many things. Mm. And uh, some of them I was wrong. Mm and uh, 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 a few of my bosses and managers had a different view. So for us, it was a matter of strategy. Mm. And at some point, you know, I had a different view of where the nation needs to look at in terms of its journalism, for mm. instance. Mm. And I don't think there's a better media house to work for in Kenya as a Kenyan media house and nation media group because mm. I've worked for Nation and Standard and mm. I can tell you that mm. uh, nation have quite some very solid structures and they They've done a lot, they've done well, mm. and I think uh, they have a bright future ahead. Mm. Um, 
for us we had some many stories or few stories that brought a lot of problems because of advertisers mm. so many times advertisers would call and say you know to put money there if this editor is still there or oh, this story has to be pulled down so there were a lot of calls if you look at my charts and my messages with even the ceo and other people mm. it was always every morning calls every morning this story this advertiser is complaining every day so you get to a point where it becomes very difficult to know no. which side do you stand. Do you stand for journalism? Do you stand for advertisers? How do you balance? Mm, mm. And and it's 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 a difficult situation to be in. Like I don't I don't envy any editor who especially is a financial editor because the people you are reporting about are basically uh, the biggest advertisers. So you outside government, the biggest company. So you you ask yourself, should I let this scandal go should i publish it how do i publish it do i water it down and you don't know whose phone call is next you don't know whose phone call is next. so i can assure you i'm not the first many editors at nation have been pushed out because of any editorial they did mm. or a story that was published that should not have been published or an advertiser that has called and he's making demands many times one of the top bosses will call and say they have asked that you are fired because of this story mm. and i'm defending you now i don't know what else to say because you know, and then you are having a conversation where you are asking yourself, is the story factual? Does it have any legal issues? Mm. Have we done our journalistic work? And mm. if the answers are yes, then you say you publish the story because of that. So there's that. But of course, there are other issues that um, every media house is suffering from. Mm. Financial nation is making losses and stuff like that. Mm. So people who are a bit more pricey or maybe seem to be more expensive or seem to be, uh, uh, I mean, but will be asked to either take a different responsibility or take a pay cut or consider you know working in a different environment so you look at it becomes difficult so you have to make a decision if you are kind of journalist that prefers this kind of terrain then you stick to it but i can say for us we were victims of uh, the shrinking media space mm. uh, and i always believe that only journalism will save journalism so mm. i think the moment we come back to journalism mm. and remember that stories matter mm and that uh, money will follow the eyeballs or whatever it is they're looking for, mm. then that's when we'll correct or we'll bring back our media to where it's supposed to be. But if we think about advertisers, bottom line, now journalists are thinking about bottom line mm. uh, for shareholders, more than they're thinking about the content, mm. more than they're thinking about the, the, the audiences, mm. you know? So what do audiences want? Mm. What are the stories that they want? What are the impactful stories? You know, mm. some of the biggest stories you remember, uh, we had stories to do with uh, broken government systems. Mm -hmm. That you know? series. Yeah, that series. Mm. Where is it now? Mm. And uh, why is it killed? Why is it, to, to what service does it serve? You can mm. understand. Well, there are many issues. So, so sometimes you take a decision over, um, let's say, uh, um, uh, the, the profitability of the media house, the savvy, uh, the quality of, of, of the stories you are putting. So it's a tricky balance for an every editor and you don't want to be in that situation, trust me, because on one day you are thinking you have budgets, you have bills to pay, you have shareholders and you have targets from a revenue standpoint, circulation. And then on the other hand, you are thinking about your journalism. It's a very tricky situation and mm. uh, I mean, I don't know what will happen. Mm. Yeah. But uh, the, I mean, Nation is a wonderful place to work. I think it made me who I am. Mm. And I have all the love and respect for what uh, those journalists do there. So mm. for us, it was a parting of, um, let's say, a mutual parting where uh, we agreed that it's best for me to take a, a, a little break, mm. have, 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 have them reorganize themselves and then see. Mm. And I thought that probably it's also time for me to take a, you know, some break out and see what else I can do. Mm. But uh i think that's what i'll say for now the mm. other things uh when you meet me next time after i've finished my sabbatical mm, <laughs> mm, i mm. might be able to tell you a few more things about mm, really mm. <laughs> really what happened yeah uh, which you know after when you leave a company uh maybe you are not supposed to speak about some things because you have that confidentiality and other things mm. if you have been a manager and stuff so mm. it's good for you to also respect that so mm. respectfully i will ask you mm. as my colleague mm. to understand for now but yeah. when you come back for your next year i'll actually discuss this <laughs> issue yeah okay. it's a big okay. story there yeah it's a big story yeah mm. it's a big story so essentially you are saying you it, it's a difficult position that uh, editors are in, in 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 many places definitely editors are in a difficult situation mm. today 
Mm. Yeah, because more than ever. More than ever. Because on the one end, you know what people want. Mm. The stories you should be publishing. Mm. But on the other end, those are the stories that you should not. You should not because the advertisers or the people who pay you don't want them to publish. So you are you, you are damned if you do and you are damned if you don't. Mm. Yeah. And then maybe the just free spaces, maybe like pro studios can carry those type of stories. I mean, we will, stories cannot die. They can only be mm. delayed. Mm. I believe that. So mm. all the stories that have, for some reason, they'll come up. And, and the digital space has given us opportunities that mm. um, we have never seen before. Mm. So once you do your job professionally and you have a solid story out, you can publish it on any other platform. Mm. So for me, I think um, one way or the other, uh, uh, there is a silver lining for, for, for journalism because mm. I mean you can't fight the entire digital space so mm. we will get these stories out there mm. in at one some form point. or the other yes mm. Uh, mm. you should watch this space mm. yeah. so we are winding up we are winding up and then so second lastly I would ask you the media today what has really changed the media we have today I, I would say that um in terms of numbers, viewership, content, and all that, I see Royal Media is doing uh, really well. I see Citizen TV is doing really well. Um, Nation Media Group uh, has changed the strategy in terms of dissemination of news, maybe for NTV and what have you. Standard Media Group has said the environment is not good. We want to do away with KTN News and merge it with, the, with, with KTN, kill a radio station here and there or something. What really is happening in this journalism or media space in Kenya? The, the media house, mm. Oboya, that does not serve the audience yeah. will die. There's no two ways about it. It's a basic business strategy. You mm. have an audience, they have needs. Mm. You have customers, you have to serve them. Mm. So if there's a disconnect between what you are serving them and what they want, they move on mm. to whoever else can provide it. So mm. the week will die from a content perspective, that's for sure. Mm. So a lot of media houses in Kenya, especially the mainstream that you mentioned, are changing their strategy because they must point or focus on what the audience wants. So those who will do that will survive. The biggest other problem I see is that they believe in a lot of these experts or consultants, bring people from Europe, from anywhere else in the world. You know, they're coming here to give them strategies that don't work here. Mm. So you're implementing strategies mm. that have even failed in the mm. US or UK, mm. but you are here implementing strategies that failed 20, 15 years ago. Mm. You know, and because it's maybe uh, a, renowned, a renowned name, you, 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 you believe it. So a lot of local media are spending a lot of money on consultancies, on what they should do, on these experts, on strategy. Instead of a simple thing, people want a good story. Mm. You, you know what a story, what, what a story is about. It's like somebody, you know very well that people prefer bread without sugar mm. what what else do you need mm. once you know that's what your customer wants you go and give them bread without sugar but mm. don't go back oh can i give you salt instead of sugar mm. can i give you this instead of that give them what exactly they want and they'll come back to your shop mm. so that's it so there's this belief that maybe consultants or strategists will solve the problem but they won't the other problem is also accountants mm. i mean I'm, I'm an accountant but i can assure you media has believed a lot in accountants to lead media houses mm. so these bean counters don't appreciate c content which is what is being sold so how to measure quality content is very difficult from a bean counters perspective they think of content like counting crates of soda or you know bottles of water so the number of stories the number of you know loaves of bread the number of cars the number of, that's what they think but content is very qualitative Mm. One story, like the toxic flow, took us three months to do. It's one story. How do you count it with a story about somebody just making a statement and then... Mm -hmm. You can't count those two things as the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, I think bean counters are destroying media. And then shareholders. You have shareholders that are very vicious on bottom line. And mm -hmm. they forget that without good content, then, uh, then there's no media. Mm -hmm. Lastly, government. Government, I think, has a lot to do with the current status of media because government have not been paying media houses. People have been uh, waiting for pending bills for more than two years. Mm. Some, some, some money that was booked two years ago has not been paid. So basically government is, 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 is financially strangling the media. Mm. So, you know, 
And then if the economy is doing so badly, like it's doing right now from a cost perspective, mm. so also companies shrink their marketing and advertising budgets. The person that hurts the most is media. So if you look at even advertising firms mm. like Scan Group, then they're loss making because mm. they depend on the advertising space. So if you look at the advertising space, that's the problem. And then now most of the money is going to, let's say, big platforms like Google, you know, mm. Facebook and the others, mm. who are basically, you know, not necessarily local here. So, so you'll find a very significant chunk because of the mass that they have. Many companies are spending their advertising budgets there. And so the media in the way it's structured today is shrinking from a revenue perspective. And that's mm. why there are losses everywhere. Mm. So from a strategy perspective, I think journalists have to serve the media. Mm. So first we must go back and focus on content. Focus on the consumer. Think about objectivity. Think about the good stories that people want. Once you have them, mm. it's like you're stuck in a shop. Mm. You know, you can't have an empty shop mm. and then brand it and want people to come. What are they coming to buy? Mm. So make sure that you have your stock. And for journalism, mm. the stock, or whatever it is that they sell, mm. is stories. Have fresh, well done, well researched stories. And there's no shortage of that. There's no shortage of that. So now you have to spend money on good journalism. Mm. So that's, if you don't have money, if you're making losses also, mm. uh, it's digging a hole that you're already inside. Does that sound like a good place to end? I will think so. Thank you for having joined the program inside the newsroom. Kaka Paul Wafula, right now the proprietor of Pro Studios, formerly of Standard Media Group and Nation Media Group, having held all those positions that you've heard about. Journalists will have to save journalism, or so he says. Thank you for joining the program. Remember, this show is sponsored by Bet Kumi and remember to bet responsibly because of what Kaka Paul Wafula has just mentioned. Until next time, I'm Brian Obuya. <laughs>